for all the trainees. I have to, I have to say this is one of my um, favorite uh, groups actually to to speak with, and you know because. You know, it's such an, an amazing opportunity that we have. And when we used to meet in person, it was it was actually a really uh, good opportunity to to, you know, share and, and to talk and and to, um, you know, um, to see, you know, what what future uh, cardiac surgery holds here in Canada. And that's you guys. So it's uh, really inspiring to see you guys holding strong to this forum uh, as, as it's been one year in. And congratulations again to all of you. So. Um, you've asked me to share a little bit about my experience with minimally invasive uh, mitral repair. Um, so I will um, work through uh, some of these slides and, and please feel free to interrupt me. Um, none of what I'm going to uh, share with you is, you know, really um, anything new that I've um, innovated or, or, or discovered. Most of it is are tips and tricks that I've learned along the way uh, from many others. Um, and, um, and, you know, the, the technique of of minimally invasive mitral valve repair really is not that uh, complicated. In fact, it's really quite simple and straightforward. So uh, obviously I come from London uh, where uh, we uh, enjoy lovely weather um, without, uh, and uh, we're fortunate to have um, some great infrastructure. So if you haven't had a chance to visit, I would encourage you to come visit. But you know, we've, we're, we're really proud to have uh, worked with a lot of great trainees, a lot of great fellows, um, and these are just a picture of a few of them, um, and it's not exhaustive by any means, but, um, you know, we've really uh, had a lot of great people here and really enjoyed having them here, and one of the one of the um, biggest attractions always is to for people to come and do minimally invasive training, but one of the things that we're most proud of is when, when, when they're able to go back and start programs uh, in their home institutions, because that's really the marker of success is whether you can go ahead and do it. And, um, and we've, uh, you know, we've uh, seen many, many new programs start and, and we've been very proud of, of each and every one of them. So our program um, has uh, been an over 20 years um, evolution. Um, and it started uh, a long time ago with uh, Doug Boyd, who, uh, who developed uh, you know, the world's first robotic coronary bypass, uh, was uh, developed as well with Al Menkes, uh, who did a lot of the early work with uh, cryoablation, mitral repair, uh, and then Bob Kiai, of course, uh, who did a lot of the seminal work with robotic coronary uh, bypass. So you know, our program encompasses all, all aspects of minimally invasive aortic valve replacement, atrial septal defect repair, hybrid operations, endoscopic conduit harvesting. The first, this was the first uh, procedure or operation that I learned how to do was an endoscopic saphenous vein. So uh, in fact, <clears throat> I have to say, I, I can't recall if we've ever done an open vein since I've been here as a resident. Um, so it's, uh, it's been a, a long tradition of this. And the, um, you can see here our experience encompasses over almost 2000 cases now. Um, and uh, about, uh, Half of the cases uh, are coronary related. The other half are, are uh, aortic valve, mitral valve, uh, atrial septal defects, tumors, other, other uh, things of that sort. So uh, we've been very fortunate to have good results, including high risk patients um, over time, which is important. To, uh, so in terms of patients with severe mitral regurgitation, it's important to have as many tools in your toolbox uh, to be able to figure out what you think is best for each patient. And so whether it's conventional uh, sternotomy and mitral repair, or if it's uh, a minimally invasive approach um, with a uh, with a endoscopic assisted uh, mitral repair, or, uh, oops, sorry, my screen, or is it uh, another approach with, for example, a mitral clip, um, which, uh, which I just did yesterday, or uh, lastly, some other more novel uh, options um, that are coming down the pipeline. So I think it's important to be able to try and choose what you think would be the best for each and every patient um, and uh, tailoring uh, your, your approach uh, to uh, their disease specifically. So what I'm gonna talk about is um, first the rationale for minimally invasive uh, mitral repair. I'm gonna talk about the important role of echocardiography, uh, how we do it here. Um, and it, uh, it may be a little different than how other places do it, but it's just one way to do it. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the results, and then if we have time, we're going to go over uh, some interesting cases. So first, why minimal invasive approach? Uh, well, you know, we, we historically, uh, many people learn how to do mitral repair through a sternotomy, and this was the gold standard, and, 
and um, you know it works well. Um, but you know the reality is is that you have to you know you have to. There's a lot of collateral damage again to the mitral valve. The mitral valve, as you know, sits the most posterior valve in the heart, and you know you have to disrupt a lot of structures to be able to get to it. You have to twist the heart like a pretzel, and even once you've done that, you have to put in several angioplasty sutures, if not all of them, to be able to see the entire valve in its entirety. And sometimes, despite all your best efforts, you still struggle to be able to see it. However, there's a new generation, uh, your generation, many of whom are learning to repair mitral valves without seeing a sternotomy, uh, and in which case you're learning how to do it with an endoscope. Uh, and the endoscope provides many advantages. Um, the view is really superior. And you know those who haven't had exposure to endoscopic visualization really are uh, oftentimes you hear that people are afraid because they just, you know, they're, they're not, they're not comfortable setting it up or getting the exposure. But the reality is with the endoscope, you can see everything even better than you can see with your own eyes. You can see all the segments of the valve. You can see all of the entire annulus without having to place in your, any of your annuloplasty sutures beforehand. And you can easily identify where the disease is and then manipulate however, uh, whatever segments you need to, um, including down within the, the subvalvar space or in the ventricle. And, you know, oftentimes people will say early in our experience that, you know, we would obviously be criticized because it was just for cosmetic surgery, but it wasn't just cosmetics. You know, the patients, they recover faster. Their, uh, their, their healing time overall is shorter. They don't have sternum that has to heal. Um, and, you know, the reality is, is that, you know, a big sternotomy isn't always necessary. So the healing, as I mentioned to you, is faster because there's no bone that has to heal. Um, but not only is it faster, uh, the healing is better. And you know, here's an example of a patient who had come to me from another center, and she had a BMI of almost 60. And you know, no surgeon wants to do uh, an operation on a patient of this size. But she had a mitral tricuspid operation, and you can see that you know her healing, despite her morbid obesity, was really quite good. The other thing is that patients really demand it. Uh, this is a, a young woman that I did from several years ago who uh, came from Calgary, went to school in Montreal, and uh, ended up coming to London to have her ASD closed. And uh, the reason that was is simply just, you know, she wanted to seek out a less invasive option. And uh, so patients really uh, are, are in charge of their own, their own um, you know, decision making, and, and they really seek out all the options, uh, even if it means traveling across the country. So ultimately, in the end, you know, it, it, you know, it, you can you can see the advantages quite easily without knowing uh, too much about the details. So the question is, how how do we do it? So with mitral repair, you know, historically you'd see these sorts of images um, at meetings, and you'd sit there and you'd wonder, wow, how did how do you get from from A to B? And you know, sometimes uh, mitral repair seems so complicated and. Uh, but the reality is, is that in most cases, it's not complicated. It's really quite simple. Um, and the pathology, you know, may seem uh, complicated, but if you stick to some simple principles, it's really quite simple. Uh, and a lot of it is sometimes related to challenges in exposure, sometimes is related to inexperience. There's a lot of um, times when there's the magic element added. Um, you'll see people talk about all sorts of things where you know they make it more complex than it really is and so you know i think that um i think that we need to simplify a lot of it um and there is some degree that it's an art to much repair but um you know i think the, the other way to look at it is that 95 percent of mitral repairs can be done using a handful of very simple techniques because most mitral repairs only require simple repair techniques for the posterior leaflet. The overwhelming majority of patients have posterior leaflet prolapse rather than anterior leaflet, bileaflet, or commissural prolapse. Most patients have single segment uh, or you know, two segment redundancy as opposed to uh, multi-segment uh, or, 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 uh, or all the segments being redundant. And, um, and when you employ these techniques, it can be really simple. I like to break it down uh, with using TEE. I think echo is really the best way to uh, make your decisions. I don't like going into an operating room uh, without knowing exactly what I'm gonna do to the mitral valve. So I think it's really important that you take your time with your echocardiographer beforehand. Get, I get a TE on every single patient um, and I make my decisions and my plan, my plan A, my plan B, my plan C, based 100% on that TE and what I see. I take the time to carefully examine every segment before I get into the operating room so that I'm not guessing when, I, when I'm sitting there looking at the uh, mitral valve. 
um, you need to carefully go through each segment by 2D and 3D. You need to correlate the regurgitant jets to the segmental findings. So if you see something that looks out of keeping, if you see color flow Doppler that's out of keeping with what you see on 2D, then you have to wonder if, if there's something up. Um, trying to identify the prolapsing segments, are they quite wide? Uh, and, and if they are, or particularly when there's flail segments, I, I like to use neocord uh, reconstruction. I find it quite easy that way. Uh, whereas if they're quite narrow, uh, if the prolapsing segments are quite narrow, I find it easiest to treat with a triangular resection. Um, and I'll tell you that with neocords or triangular resection, that is that makes up you know 99% of the repairs that, uh, that I do. So here's an example where you know you'll take a look and you take a couple of uh, a couple of nerve hooks just like we were taught or you see in videos from 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 uh, Carpentier and you walk through each segment. I, I I'm doing this only for the video uh, because the reality is is I prefer to make these decisions and these assessments based on the TE beforehand uh, so that I know in advance what I'm going to have to do because I I truly think that the that the echo on the beating heart is much more accurate than wanting to see with my eyes. I think we uh, we convince ourselves by pulling enough and by looking at it, oh, that looks diseased, that doesn't look diseased. I think we overestimate our ability to tell what, what really uh, disease is uh, when we look with our own eyes. So in this case, I knew beforehand that you know it was a Barlow's valve. I knew I was gonna have to place neocordate loops support to every segment of this valve. and. Uh, and uh, so one of the things when you're using neocords is important rather than traditional A1, A2, A3 segmentation or P1, P2, P3, I just split the valve into quadrants. Uh, so anterior, posterior, and then medial and lateral. And when you think about it, the, the neocords when you attach to the papillary heads have to stick within the quadrants. As long as, long as you don't cross any of the quadrants, you won't cause any uh, contralateral restriction. Um, and so when your disease crosses the quadrant, then you need another set of neocords on the other side of the other quadrant. So simple principles. And then here you can see the sort of final sort of saline test. And I, I think we all become accustomed to doing a saline test, but you know, I have to say, you know, don't put all your eggs in one basket. The saline test helps you to, to, to confirm things, but you know, sometimes uh, when the heart's uh, not beating and when you're, you're, you're filling it uh, well beyond normal physiologic dimensions, um, you know, it's hard to say accurately whether or not that, that's, that's going to true show the true competency or not. So, you know, it's nice to be able to see a competent sailing test, but I, I wouldn't uh, lay all your money on that. Okay. Um... Sorry, my computer is frozen. Oops. Um. So here you can see the post-op result and, you know, um, evaluating things carefully on the post-op echo, you know, echo, the, the echo tells all the truth there, you know, it's your best friend. Um, so take, you know, time, make sure the ventricle is loaded properly, make sure uh, that you filled the heart properly um, and you slow the heart rate down nicely, uh, just in case you're concerned if there's any SAM and take a look at each segment to make sure that you're happy with the repair. It's a hard thing to make a decision to reclamp uh, to re-repair it, but you know, you know in advance uh, if there's areas that you're concerned about, uh, things that you might have changed, uh, and if that's the case, if you can get a perfect result, you know, uh, make that decision uh, to uh, reclamp and 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 get, get the perfect result that you that you want because your patient deserves that. So, um, you know, getting back to my point, I think you should trust the echo, not your eyes, um, because the echo really tells you the truth. So spend a lot of time uh, learning how to read echo, spend a lot of time with your echocardiographers, you know, uh, spend a lot of time thinking about your repair beforehand. And then when you get into the operating room, you, you should be using that time to, uh, to confirm what you, what you suspect on the echo, not the other way around. So uh, just to uh, um, you know, talk about a little bit about the techniques. So I like to use neocordate loop reconstruction uh, about 85 to 90 percent of the time, um, and I find it um, you know fairly simple. I find it easy to apply to every segment of the valve, posterior, anterior, commissural, 
um, and you know it's it's really easy to uh, make small adjustments um, rather than resection where you'd have to change your resection margins and things and I'll show you some examples of this. The reasons I like to use neocords uh, are really because you know, I feel that it maximizes the co-optation surface. You get a greater height of co-optation because instead of resecting that really tall posterior leaflet, you pull it down and you use all of it for co-optation. Uh, so you, in fact, increase your co-optation surface. Uh, additionally, because you don't do a resection uh, posteriorly, you don't have to worry about bringing the annulus forward. So you, you in, in fact, can pick larger rings uh, when you use neocords than if you do a resection. And as a result, you get lower gradients. And you know, there's lots of uh, individuals who have published a long-term series with really uh, excellent, durable, long-term results as well. So. So, for example, with posterior leaflet prolapse, um, we uh, uh, have developed this echo-based uh, technique to be able to measure, and it's based on the principle that you're going to use that entire posterior leaflet, pull it down to the ventricle, and use it all for coaptation. So instead of resecting any, you, uh, you have to estimate, and this is where it's an estimation, you measure the length from the papillary head up to the coaptation surface, and then you have to subtract the redundant portion of the leaflet. So oftentimes, this measurement here will measure somewhere between 25 and 35 millimeters, and then you'll subtract the extra portion, which can be up to a, a centimeter. Uh, and it's quite often that you'll get a measurement of the posterior leaflet neocord somewhere right between 14 and 18 millimeters. I measure this four to five times in different views um, and, uh, and take an average of them. And uh, here's an example, uh, let me get rid of the sound. This is a bit of an old video, but it shows you the, the, the sorts of principles. So here's a posterior leaflet prolapse. You can see the segment there quite easily. You can see, in fact, it's a flail segment. Uh, then identify the papillary head, which it's coming from. Sometimes you can see the rupture, where, which you can see in this video. Um, and I pre-make my uh, neocordae loops. And in fact, I pass my Gore-Tex through the loops so, so to keep it simple, so you don't have to go fishing for them. Um, so once you tie it down, uh, after that, you basically just fan out all three loops and attach it uh, to the free margin with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Gore-Tex, separate Gore-Tex sutures. You pull it down, and then you do your annuloplasty after that. And the rest is uh, fairly straightforward. So here you can see on a saline test already, it looks uh, like we're going to achieve competence. Um, and uh, and then the annuloplasty goes in after. And and this is the thing with when you're doing it minimally invasively, you have great exposure to the entire valve, so you don't have to put in your annuloplasty sutures in first. And in fact, I prefer to do it after I finish my leaflet repair work because it saves having less sutures in your face, um, particularly when you keep a small uh, port incision. So there you can see um, the ring coming down and the final sort of uh, result. Here's the, the, the post-operative echo again. So here you can see on, on the post-operative echo, that entire posterior leaflet is pulled down here to serve uh, for a coaptation with the anterior leaflet. So you get a huge area of coaptation um, right across the entire posterior leaflet. Uh, and, uh, and that's, you know, that's, uh, that's oftentimes much greater than what I see when I do uh, resections. Here's another advantage I want to show you. So this is another case of a, a posterior leaflet uh, prolapse where I've, uh, I've gone ahead and identified the posterior prolapse segment. I've marked it here where I thought that it should be, the, the neocord should be uh, sutured in, uh, so to give my fellows a guide. And then when you, what you can see, um, I'm going to skip ahead here. Um, so here we are here, and what you can see on the saline test, even though my neocords are down, there's a little segment here, just a little bit lateral uh, to where I had placed my neocords, which still looks like it's prolapsing. I don't know if you can see that. Um, and so, you know, what I what I'm concerned about here is that I haven't actually uh, applied. Uh, neocords quite wide enough uh, to the lateral segment here. So instead, you know, had I done a resection here, I'd have to take down my resection margin and I'd have to widen my resection margin. Uh, so to redo the, the uh, sutures. Um, and so instead of doing that with neocords, what you all you have to do is just shift. Uh, so what I've done is I've taken down, I'll just come back here a little bit. Um, I've identified my most lateral uh, loop and 
I've taken it down. Uh, I've detached it here. And uh, you'll see that here in a moment. So I've, I've, I'll detach my most lateral loop. I'll cut the uh, suture. Oh, so what I've done instead, I've grabbed the, the loop and then uh, I've grabbed the loop first so I didn't lose it. And then I cut it and then I'm gonna bring it a little bit more lateral. And so once I've attached that and then saline tested it again, oops. Sorry, I didn't have time to edit this properly. Let's see here. You can see that, oops. You can see that on the saline test, with, by moving my cord more laterally, the competency looks better there. You can see that, that that segment of the posterior leaflet's pulled down nicely. So I think that you know it's a it's a fairly simple sort of minor modification, uh, but it can really um, you know uh, be quite simple to do. So in terms of anterior leaflet uh, flail. Um, the principles are the same, but it's 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 fairly uh, simple. So the anterior leaflet is rarely as redundant as the posterior leaflet, um, and it's mostly a matter of just rotating that flail segment down and measuring from the papillary head up to the posterior leaflet. Uh, and in most cases, the the neocordial length measures between 25 and 30 millimeters. And here you can see, in this case, this is an anterior leaflet uh, flail, and I think that you can you can see here. Uh, the ruptured cord uh, when I pull on it with a nerve hook. Um, and, uh, and so the important thing with the anterior leaflet when you is, is just making sure that you're at, attaching the neocords to the appropriate head. And so take your time to be able to look down. You can see where the native cords are, are intact here uh, on both sides. And uh, if you can't identify where the, where the rupture is, uh, then you can, uh, then you can, uh, you can take a look down and see uh, whether or not you uh, think that it attaches more commonly to the posterior medial head, which is more common, uh, or the anterior lateral head, uh, based on the other cords that are uh, that are uh, underlined and still attached. And so, um, in this case, I think you can see there the uh, rupture uh, down there. Um, in the uh, anterior head of, of the posterior medial papillary muscle. And so that's what I used uh, there to be able to attach uh, these three loops. And, uh, there you can see the loops being attached uh, to the papillary head and, now, and then fanning out all three loops here um, to the anterior leaflet. And uh, and then tying them down into place And then there you can see the post-operative result. And then by leaflet, it's just a combination of the two. Um, I won't belabor this too much, but you can see again, uh, the, when you're doing by leaflet prolapse, always do the posterior first. And the reason it is, is because you're really down in this hole working by yourself. So once you've attached the posterior set, uh, it'll fall down. If you attach the anterior set first, it'll fall down into your, into your way. So do the posterior first, uh, work with gravity, let it fall out of your way. And then you can do the, you can do the anterior set uh, after. Um, and uh, and uh, some people like to use uh, different uh, retractors to be able to hold. Uh, the leaflets open, and you can do that too. Um, that works. Uh, that can work quite quite well. You'll see many of those, particularly my European colleagues, will use uh, those sorts of retractors. So again, just to reinforce the simple rules: don't cross the midline. Uh, keep anterior to anterior. Keep posterior to posterior. Try not to disrupt native cords, and if you can, see where the ruptured cord originated from. In terms of determining the length, um, we published this uh, uh, last year or the year before in the annals. Uh, you know, the, 
this is, remains the biggest problem of neocord estimation uh, that you can find over 50 papers uh, in different ways of estimating the neocordate length. Uh, most of them rely upon eyeballing, what I call it, where it's done on the arrested heart um, and, and uh, you just fill the ventricle with as much saline as you can. And then you look to see by saline tests if there's any residual leak. It's a bit of a trial and error. Um, and, uh, you know, I find that uh, uh, I find this to be less reliable, and and so, you know, what you can result in when you when when you when you have neocord length measurement problems, you get recurrent MR. Uh, oftentimes, you can, if it's too, uh, if you restricted the leaflet, you'll reverse the jet, um, and uh, sometimes it can cause heart failure or uh, sorry hemolysis, uh, and uh, obviously the recurrent MR can cause cause heart failure. So this is just to reiterate again for posterior leaflet, um, uh, you can see here the flail segment, rotate it down. And you have to measure um, the uh, from the papillary head up to the coaptation zone uh, and subtract that extra length of the posterior leaflet to be able to measure your neocord. For anterior leaflet, again, it's mostly just rotating it down to meet with that posterior leaflet. Um, and uh, there's not a lot of extra length to be able to re re subtract. And then by leaflet, it's just a combination of the two. Um, and so it's, it's fairly uh, straightforward. Uh, I like to use the uh, prefabricated uh, neocordial loops. So uh, in, in Leipzig, uh, the head nurse, Frau Conrad, used to have these parties with the nurses where they would make them, keep them sterile. Um, but uh, when I came back here to London, uh, they wouldn't let me do that to re-sterilize things. So uh, there are uh, commercially available uh, loops on the market that you can purchase uh, to do this with, um, uh, but uh, they do cost a little bit more, but uh, we make our own here in London. And so we measure it uh, based on the TE beforehand and then just make it on the back table. Um, yeah, but you can use any technique that you want for making loops. If if you prefer doing single loops, uh, this technique works fine for that. That echo-based measurement technique works fine. So um, I'll just show you in the, the example, the first 264 patients that we did, uh, this tech echo-based technique worked well with 90% accuracy uh, and um, with no conversions to replacement. Um, and in uh, five patients, I had made an error. Uh, and in four patients, I converted to a resection. And, uh, and uh, I'll show you an example of a case here. So this is an anterior leaflet uh, flail, um, and I made 23 millimeter anterior leaflet neocordate loops. And you can see here the residual jet uh, or recurrent jet. So the jet switched directions. It went anteriorly because uh, my neocords were too short. And so what I did was I took it down and redid it um, and made them 27 millimeter and long and just that four millimeters will make a significant difference, particularly for the anterior leaflet. Two to three millimeters for the posterior leaflet probably makes no difference at all because you have enough redundancy there, but for the anterior leaflet, it does make a difference. And my mistake in this case was that I actually, when I went back to look at the films, uh, I accepted uh, views of the mitral uh, valve with the subvalvar apparatus with, excuse me, where I thought the papillary muscle was when it actually wasn't there. Um, I was just seeing echo artifacts. So that's why it's really important to make sure that you go through the pre-op TEs well, and that your echocardiographers know what views that you want to be able to see and to be able to, you know, quite often they'll cone in so tight that you won't be able to see the papillary muscles. So they need to make sure that they keep that within their, their, their field of view. Uh, so in general, anterior leaflet neocordial loops, in my experience, are 26 to 30 millimeters, uh, and I generally keep it at three loops only. I used to make four, but I've reduced that to three because I don't find the fourth is all that useful. And with posterior leaflet neocordial loops, uh, about 16 to 20 millimeters, and I still use three uh, as well at a time. So uh, let's switch now to talk about some of the, uh, you know, sort of pearls or some of the tips and tricks of mini mitral repair. Um, let's talk about select patient selection, operative setup peripheral cannulation, the intrathoracic setup, the repair, which we've talked a lot about, and then the closure. So patient selection, uh, obviously uh, you want to uh, start uh, uh, with the easier patients. Make, make, it, you know, make it easier for yourself. You want to choose the, the, the tall, thin patients uh, with a good body habitus. As you get more experience, you're going to pick the patients who are a little bit bigger uh, and those with comorbidities. These patients are more challenging, but these are also the patients that benefit more from the less invasive approach. And then the, the, the ones that I consider the most difficult or challenging are those that are re-operations, uh, those with significant uh, you know, pulmonary hypertension and RV dysfunction, and then those who require a lot of concomitant uh, procedures. 
Um, in terms of the pathology itself, you know, start with simple repairs, those with posterior leaflet prolapse, these are the easiest, those with pure annular dilatation, uh, or those that, you know, have uh, severe rheumatic uh, disease or ischemics that you're just going to replace the valve. Um, these ones are nice ones to start with. I then move on to more difficult ones with anterior leaflet or limited bileaflet. And then, you know, lastly, move on to the uh, Barlow's valves, the commissural prolapse, the endocarditis patients, or those with MAC, who you're going to plan a decalcification operation. When you work at a distance, uh, you know, decalcification can be challenging because your long shafted instruments will slip off of it. And uh, so you need to use uh, special instruments. Uh, I have special uh, long rangers that I borrow from, from neurosurgery uh, to do these uh, operations as well. And and, um, and some other special long suction and things when you deal with the really complicated MAC cases. Uh, when, you're, when you're looking at anatomic uh, factors, um, you know, I get a CT on every patient uh, beforehand, and the CT can be really helpful uh, for guiding certain things. So for example, um, when you're planning your incision, uh, you look at the, the size of their chest and how big they are. Uh, when you see tall, lanky people with very broad chests, you might think initially, wow, that's going to be an easy case. That's slam dunk. But you have to realize the length of your instruments. So for example, when you look at, the, when you look at how far it is to the mitral valve, you know, uh, for example, if you're planning a more anterior approach, uh, that's about 160 millimeters. Uh, well, that, that's going to work really well for you, as opposed to a more lateral approach, that's about 200 millimeters, uh, where that's at the length of your instrument. Um, so you, you want to think about this in advance and, and make it easier for yourself. So pick something in a range that you're going to have access access around 150 to one, you know, 170 uh, millimeters, and you'll find yourself in good range to be able to reach the mitral valve quite easily. Uh, obviously, you want favorable chest wall anatomy, avoiding patients with severe pectus uh, that can make it challenging. Uh, you want to choose an approach that you're going to be nicely orthogonal to the mitral valve. There's no point in choosing a really anterior approach, similar to what you find in a sternotomy, when you're going to have to rotate the heart like a pretzel to be able to get exposure to it. Um, and, uh, you know, the more rotational force you put on the heart, the more you're apt to, you know, cause problems when you give cardioplegia, the more pressure you're going to place on the aorta, the more challenges you're going to have with disruption the 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 cardioplegia needle or the balloon however you're you're going to choose to use it um, in terms of your operative setup and team uh, I you know keep it simple I, I use a small roll behind the right side of the chest so it's a 20 degree left lateral to decubitus position I like using a double lumen endotracheal tube on every case um, and, and uh, we uh, like to uh, prep uh, right from the, the jaw all the way down uh, to just a, below the groin um, and place so it allows us to place the neckline simultaneously as we're working on femoral uh, cannulation uh, at the same time. It's important to make sure that you, uh, that you uh, uh, um, keep the elbow uh, covered uh, so you don't get an ulnar neuropathy and then keep the, uh, keep the wrist up as well. Um, Think about the angle of attack, um, and so I, I know that uh, when you when you come out laterally, sometimes when you first start, you'll you'll find some cases that are super easy, and some cases that are really hard, and you may not recognize what it's related to. But in many cases, it's related to your your approach. Um, and so, for example, when you have a more superior approach um, or a more anterior approach, it provides you with better visualization of the medial aspect of the mitral valve. And particularly, if you're going to look at the subvalvar apparatus, this becomes very important because you can have you can have a, a, an approach with a, a wide degree um, uh, um, that, to be able to look just at the mitral valve itself. But if you want to get deep to the subvalvar apparatus, um, you know you will be challenged uh, in some patients if you don't have the right angle of approach. Um, so you need a uh, you know if you have a more superior or anterior approach. For, and you have more uh, disease, mitral disease that's based more on the medial aspect of the valve, you'll be in far better shape than in the opposite. And the, the opposite goes uh, for the anterolateral part of the valve. So if you know that you, for example, have a anterolateral commissural flail, well, then you definitely want an approach that is more inferior and more lateral uh, because you'll get a much better view of, of the, uh, the lateral commissure with that. And so this is something simple, but something easy to think about. In terms of your team, you know, you need to invest in your team. You need to take the time to train and teach each member and so that they take responsibility for different aspects of the operation so that you don't have to worry about it. It makes it really hard when you're doing the operation and you're worrying about every single aspect, for example, from neckline cannulation 
uh, here, which uh, our anesthesiologist and, and our assistant Jill uh, takes care of, or you know, down here, femoral cannulation, where our, our fellow Paula, uh, who some of you may know, and, and our other assistant are, are addressing. Uh, and it makes it a seamless transition from one step to the other. It helps to save significant efficiencies uh, and time. Uh, and it enables you to focus on the most important aspects of the operation so that you don't have to worry about all the other uh, things. So just to give you an example here, you know, we used to do these in series, uh, whereas now we, we do them in parallel. Um, and so, you know, with the induction and anesthesia at the same time, the neckline's going in, femoral cannulation is being performed. As femoral cannulation is being performed, the chest is being opened, uh, and then the mitral repair uh, is being done so that, you know, you can focus your energies on that. Uh, then after that, the chest is being closed at the same time as femoral decannulation, and all the volume is being returned through the neckline, uh, which is the last thing to be decannulated so that you can close up the groin uh, at the same time until you take this out. So, and that's really how you can uh, speed up your time efficiency so you can get two cases done every day without troubles. Uh, it's important to monitor for distal limb perfusion. Um, and, you know, years ago when we started our program, we used a SAT probe, but as many of you will know, the SAT probe doesn't work when you go on pump. And so what we've, uh, what we switched to was nearest monitoring on the legs. Uh, and it really helps to show you when you have a perfusion problem. And the last thing or the worst thing in the world is that you do these operations, you get a great mitral repair, but you have an ischemic leg uh, that needs fasciotomies or an amputation. And, and you know, you've really failed or missed the, missed the bar there. In terms of cannulation, uh, it's really important uh, to, to make sure that you, you do it well and do it safely. Uh, don't be sloppy, uh, you know, follow good Seldinger technique uh, and make sure that you can see things at all times. Use, use the TE for arterial and venous cannulation. When cannulas are in place, you need to check, recheck, and recheck it again. Don't assume that it hasn't moved. Uh, when your perfusionist tells you that the arterial line pressure has just suddenly shot up, stop and uh, check what's happened because if you're not careful, you'll get a retrograde dissection related to uh, you know, lifting a plaque or the cannula migrating or things like that. So it's important to have TE re frequent reassessment of the aorta. And then you know, what's really important is to ensure adequate venous drainage. Uh, and this is where it's really important to, to have good communication with your perfusionist. Uh, make sure that you make sure that you um, that you uh, uh, have vac assist available and make sure that your cannulas are in the right place um, because because you're you're not you're not seeing the whole heart all at once uh, and uh, you know you sometimes will get lost in doing the mitral repair and not pay attention to where your cannulas are or whether or not you have you know, the right side of the heart is full and that can be that can really be fatal the other thing that i didn't uh, i didn't mention here but is so important is is making sure that you protect the heart well um, and um, and uh, you make sure that you give a good induction dose. I like to use del needle cardioplegia, but it doesn't matter. You can use whatever you'd like. Uh, what I can tell you though is whatever cardioplegia technique you use, make sure you do it well and make sure that the plegia is getting to the coronary arteries. Not infrequently, people will assume that, you know, because their perfusionist gave the plegia that it got to the heart. But, you know, this is where it's really important. Check with your endoscope. Check with, you know, uh, that the aorta is filling and it's pressurizing. When you place a cross clamp, if you use a transthoracic clamp or if you use a balloon, uh, you have to be very sure or very careful because when you place a transthoracic cross clamp, what you don't recognize is sometimes when you place it, you can actually, uh, you can actually push the, uh, the ascending aorta towards the root and cause the aortic valve to become incompetent. So even though you think you're giving the plege, it's not actually going anywhere and it's going into the ventricle and you're not actually protecting the heart. And if, if you use del needle cardioplegia like I do, you need to make sure that in, that induction dose all gets to the coronaries because you're gonna go another hour or so without giving the next dose. Uh, in terms of the neckline, we always use a neckline. We have a protocol where we, where we put this in under ultrasound and TE guidance. Uh, it's really important to develop something like this. Um, some people uh, routinely will do it without a neckline. And, and, and you know, the frequent comment that you'll get is, well, we get away with it. Um, and, and that's fine. You may get away with it. But there are times when you have long cases, complicated cases, where uh, you've, you know, you've, you've compromised venous return from the brain. And I'll show you uh, that uh, in a moment. So here's our, our sort of routine. We check on short axis and long axis that both wires are inside uh, the, the vein. And then once we know that they're both inside the vein and inside the heart, at that time we give 5,000 to heparin. Um, and then um, 
we cannulate. And once we okay. uh, have the cannulas in place, Testing before we go on pump, we always test that the neckline is actually working. And this is something that you know you can't do uh, when you're minimally invasive. Just you see that moves. it's filled with blood. Um, but you don't actually know if it's draining properly. Uh, and if your neckline has migrated well, the neckline into the mediastinum, you won't know that at all because Terminal it just looks like it's filled with blood, but it's not actually draining. Um, and so it's really important to, to check that. And so that's a small, simple step, but, uh, but uh, really can help to confirm that you're draining properly. So here's a copy of our checklist, and if you'd like it, you're welcome to it. Uh, just let me know. Um, we did a randomized trial years ago uh, where we looked at randomizing patients uh, to uh, periods of clamping the neckline versus not clamping it, such that, you know, simulating not having a neckline in. And what we found was that there was a significant difference in surgical visualization uh, with inadequate drainage without the neckline. But we also found that there were metabolic parameters that suggested that the uh, that the brain uh, wasn't being adequately drained. Uh, so you know this is why we use a neckline on every single case, um, and uh, and we feel that it's important and valuable. Additionally, uh, we looked at um, uh, when we first instituted uh, the nearest perfusion of the lower legs. Uh, this is uh, around the same time that I switched from uh, cannulas in the arteries to uh, a side graft. And with a side graft, I believe that there's two advantages. One is that you have better distal perfusion to the lower leg, particularly in younger patients with smaller arteries uh, where they can spasm quite easily. Uh, and number two, uh, it's, uh, I think that it, it really is, has a lower risk, uh, theoretical risk uh, for dissection, for retrograde dissection, because you don't have a cannula that's poking up that could lift a plaque. Um, and the line pressures with a graft are, are low. They're, they're normal sort of line pressures that you'd get with any other, you know, between a, a 100 to 200 millimeters of mercury. Whereas with a cannula, frequently and commonly, you'll have line pressures between 300 and 400 millimeters of mercury. So... So if you have small arteries or significant plaque, uh, be liberal to use a uh, uh, side graft. So what are some of the results? So I want to share with you, uh, you know, um, this, this is a, a study that we had presented at uh, EACS a couple of years ago. Fadi Haj, uh, one of our residents had presented it where we looked at simple versus complex uh, repairs. Um, and uh, what I wanted to show you from that was uh, that when we followed our patients out late, the survival was uh, equal between both groups and equally quite good. So out to nine years, survival rates of uh, 83 to 92 percent. Uh, freedom from uh, MR out to uh, that point was uh, was uh, 97 to 98 percent, and then these patients had good quality of life and very few uh, reoperations. So um, you know the results with the uh, minimally invasive endoscopic approach is, is has been really excellent here. Uh, when we looked at comparing uh, our results with minimally invasive versus sternotomy, this is an inverse probability weighted adjusted uh, comparison that uh, uh, Ali Haj had done uh, for me, uh, looking at recurrent MR. And you can see here sternotomy in the red, minimally invasive in the blue, and you can see uh, out to uh, 72 months that uh, it's really uh, freedom from recurrent MR is excellent, 95 to 97%. And then the survival uh, still remains excellent uh, at uh, up to eight years between sternotomy. So, you know, the moral of the story is you can do equally as good of a job minimally invasive as through sternotomy with quality of repair, uh, and it doesn't affect uh, survival. And then uh, most recently, uh, Fadi had presented this at, at EACS, and I, I just wanted to share this with you. When we looked at, uh, we looked at uh, coaptation height uh, and, um, and uh, comparing... Uh, uh, shorter coaptation height of less than 11 millimeters was greater than 11 millimeters, and we found no difference at survival. But what we, what we did find was a difference in recurrent MR. Um, and when we stratify this uh, by um, a different length, so red here is less than seven millimeters of coaptation height. Uh, next is uh, orange, which is uh, seven to nine millimeters. Green is nine to 11 millimeters, and blue is greater than 11 millimeters. And you'll notice the difference in numbers here, down here. Um, and there were very few in, that had less than seven millimeters of coaptation, or that were in the orange with seven to nine millimeters, but it certainly affected the durability of the mitral repair. So this is where it becomes really important to try and optimize your coaptation height or your coaptation area uh, at the time of your repair because it translates into better durability uh, from recurrent MR. So in conclusion, minimally invasive techniques are feasible uh, for all types of mitral valve disease. 
it's really uh, you know critical uh, uh, to have these skills in your comprehensive mitral team. Um, it allows you to maximize the benefits of surgical mitral repair with a much less invasive, less invasive approach with a quicker recovery and high patient satisfaction. And that, uh, that uh, additionally, uh, this minimal invasive endoscopic approach uh, can really enable unique solutions in higher risk patients. And, um, and so in the end, you really need to tailor your mitral repair to your patient's needs and desires. And, uh, and so I think that the more tools you have in your armamentarium, the better off you'll be. So um, I think what I'll do is I will stop there. I was going to show a couple of cases, but I, I, I'd like to stop and, and, um, and maybe take some questions. And, and if people still want to see the case, then uh, a case or two, then I can show you that uh, case. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Chu. That was great. I actually think Rashmi, uh, Toronto resident, she has a question. So she's raised her hand. If you want to go ahead, Rashmi, you can ask your question. Hi, Rashmi. Hi, Dr. Chu. Uh, thank you, Abigail. That was wonderful. Um, I feel like I ha I, I'm trying to get, I'm getting to the point in like my surgical residency where I can start to understand like what minimally invasive approaches are. So I, I feel like this is a really timely uh, talk for me to kind of chime in on. I had two questions. The first sure. one had to do with, so you said something about this kind of bicable cannulation that I didn't really know was an option. So if you clamp off your neckline, that's effectively not cannulating your SVC, right? So that's like right. that would, and I remember asking this question for just open mitral valve repair. I asked like, can you get away without cannulating your SVC? And uh, the surgeon said, no way. So, <laughs> I was just curious because what you said made it seem as though you maybe could, like you, at least you can. Yes, you, you, you can. There are surgeons who do sternotomy based mitral operations without putting an SVC cannula in. There are not that many, but there are, many, there, there are some that do that. And the whole principle is when you retract the left atrium, uh, you know, through a sternotomy, you pull so hard on the left atrial retraction that you actually kink off the SVC and it won't drain properly. So for example, if you do your operation quick enough, uh, you know, it's functionally effectively just clamping the SVC and you can get away with it. When you're doing it minimally invasively, remember your, your angle of approach isn't coming through the, the front, you're coming through the side. So the degree of left atrial retraction is less. Mm. So, so when, you're, when, you're, when you have your left atrial retractor in it, whether it's a fixed blade or robotic arm or a, 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 um, a mobile blade, whatever you're using, um, the degree of retraction will likely still allow some degree of SVC drainage. However, if you're not careful and depending on the patient's anatomy, you may cut off all the SVC drainage as well. And, you know, people oftentimes talk about placing a cannula through the IVC, through the right atrium into the SVC. Mm. I guarantee you this in every single case, when people do that, when you pull your left atrial retraction on, what happens is the cannula gets pulled out of the SVC and up into the right atrium. It always happens every time. So, you know, this is why I, I think that bicaval cannulation is key because the thing is you have to remember in minimally invasive surgery, you're working in a very small hole. If you don't drain adequately or properly, there'll be a ton of blood in your face and it'll make your life hell. So, you know, with good drainage, it gives you time. You can, you know, you can see well um, and, um, and it makes your life so much easier. And you don't need a big cannula in the neck to be able to drain properly. You know, we generally use 15 or 16 French cannulas, but to be honest, I bet you, you could use a 10 French and be, it would be fine too. I see. And then what do you do? Cause it looks percutaneous. So what do you do? You just pull the cannula at the end. So at the end of the case, uh, put a purse string suture in it, uh, pull it, uh, put some pressure on it and uh, that's it. The stitch stays in until, you know, uh, for two or three days and then it comes out. Okay. Amazing. That's really great. Yep. And then the other question I, I had was, uh, I've asked like several minimally invasive surgeons just because they, ha they have different answers. I'm always curious. What goes through your working port? Different people have like different things that they put through their working port. I'm just curious. So generally it's, it's long shafted instruments, the repair ring, uh, repair sutures. Um, that would be the ma majority of what goes through it. I see. Okay. Cause I've, I've heard of people like, you know, putting drop in suckers through their working port, but I've also heard of other. Yeah. Of so, so it really, like so a lot of this is just a different style, right? Depends on the size of your working port. I like to put my, my drop in sucker through a, a separate stab wound, mm -hmm. okay. uh, which I also use for the Blake drain at the end of the case. 
But uh, some people will, in fact, you know, the guys at NYU, for example, they make a thoracotomy so big that everything goes through there. So the cross clamp goes through there, the pleage goes through there, uh, the all the instrumentation goes through there, the cable snares go through there. Uh, it it just really depends um, on the size of your of your access. Is so is your like feeling that only like your working instruments go through your working port? Is that the way you feel about that? I don't think it really matters. You know, I think that, okay. um, you know, I think what you have to separate is that there's a lot of uh, debate that goes on within the minimally invasive surgeons that probably is just as much about ego as it is for anything else. Uh, so, you know, we like to fluff up our feathers to talk about how small our ports are and, you know, how it's, it's how, how least invasive it is. And, um, you know, but the reality is, is that the principles are all the same and it's, it's a, a lot of it's just different style and what, what you like and what you get comfortable with. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, my pleasure. Any other questions? I have a question, Dr. Shu. I might've just muted you by accident. Sorry. Uh, the, uh, so yeah, so I was actually just um, attended like a, sort of a mini a minimally invasive conference here on the west side and one of the things that came up and i'd love to hear your thoughts about it uh was uh one so obviously in terms of the evidence so the evidence between minimally invasive techniques and the sternotomy um i think that you know we're talking about minimally invasive in cardiac surgery it really it really is related to the incision not necessarily the surgery get, that gets done because nothing should be jeopardized based on your incision or your approach to the case um so in terms of one, I guess, do you, what is your opinion? Do you think all centers should now be offering some level of minimally invasive option? Do you think that there should be a bigger referral system for patients who are seeking that out, who are then referred to other centers to have it? And then related to that, which is a similar question, I think, is why hasn't there or should there be an RCT to actually sort of once and for all come up with really strong evidence to say whether or not one approach is superior to the other. Yeah. So, that. so I guess uh, several, several thoughts. Um, you know, I, I think that the approach, uh, less invasive techniques should be available at all sites and all centers. You know, I will be very happy if I finish my career and there's a, a well entrenched, well developed minimally invasive program at every center in Canada. I, I think that would be fabulous. And I think it should be, you know, because I think patients should all have these sorts of options. Um, you know, I think getting there is, you know, it can be a bit of a challenge, but it's not insurmountable. It's a matter of training the next generation. And, you know, every center has different sorts of challenges. Um, but the reality it comes down to is getting good training. So I think where, you know, I think it's, um, it would be a bit, bit naive to think that you can go and, and do a weekend course and say, okay, I'm ready to do it now. Uh, I think the reality is to get a program up and running uh, safely, you really you know, need to send yourselves, young trainees to go and get uh, comprehensive training, a fellowship training. Uh, because the thing is, um, you know, when the cases go well, uh, you know, many people can do that, right? You don't go train to get trained to 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 just learn how to do it well. You get trained to learn how to get out of complications and how to deal with complications, and that that's that's one of the key sorts of things. So I think, you know, um, the other thing is that historically, particularly with mitral repair, you know, in some centers there's been uh, referral biases, and where you know more senior surgeons have never invested the time to learn or have been unwilling to support younger trainees to do mitral repair. So they've tended to try and hold on to the mitral repair patients themselves. But, you know, this will eventually disappear with time and attrition and, you know, uh, patients, you know, seek it out. And so I think that, yeah, it, you know, patients will travel, like I showed you to other places, but it's not a, it's not a, um, a, a great solution for the, the, in the entire population as a whole. What's a better solution is that we train people to be able to do it everywhere, uh, to do it well and safely uh, so that we can provide it to all patients. Uh, and with regards to an RCT, you know, I think the, 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 um, the challenges will be is finding places with equipoise. So, you know, you, you, you see um, places that are well entrenched in one side or the other. 
where they just will not have willingness to randomize. Uh, and that I think will be the big challenge. And I think that the ship may have sailed too far to allow, you'd have to find very special locations with very special surgical teams that are willing to truly randomize each patient to be able to make it happen. And I think that, you know, without that, you're going to have a lot of biases put into place where they're only going to randomize certain types of patients uh, and you won't really see the difference. The other thing is that, um, you know, uh, we, there's so much evidence out there as a minimally invasive surgeon, uh, you know, uh, I would have a hard time uh, ignoring that weight, albeit observational evidence uh, to, you know, not offer my patients uh, that less invasive approach, particularly when we have a well-established program uh, as well. So those would be my, my sort of high level thoughts on it. Okay, thank you. And then um, Ali actually put in the chat. There's a question here. Uh, says, thanks for the great presentation, Dr. Chu. Can you please highlight your preferences with the type of mitral rings, complete versus partial, flexible versus semi-rigid? So, uh, you know, I, I don't think it really matters all that much, but uh, I like using complete rings. Uh, you know, I think uh, most minimally invasive surgeons use complete rings. Um, most sternotomy-based surgeons use partial rings or bands uh, because you know you don't have to worry about trying to see that anterior portion but you can see it really well minimally invasively um, you know i like using uh semi-rigid uh rings rather than flexible um but i'm not sure it makes a huge difference when i do combined aortic mitral cases i usually will use a band instead of a instead of a full ring uh just to not interact with the uh, areas of aortic mitral continuity um, but those are my preferences I think Ali has a Ali has his hand up. Ali Hassan. Yeah, sorry. I think I'm a different Ali. So, uh, yeah, my question was about uh, your experience with uh, elongation of the neocordae in the cases of reverse remodeling of the ventricle. What's your experience with that, and what if what do yeah. you do in that case? Yeah, Ali, that's a great question. So, when I first started uh, doing neocordae loop reconstruction. Um, here in London, one of my cardiologists asked that question. And I, and, you know, I said, well, I really have no idea. And what I can say is that over the past um, 12 years, uh, I have not seen um, a significant population of patients that have uh, had a competent valve. And then with remodeling, suddenly started to develop MR because of the cortical length. Um, and I suspect a lot of it may be Related to the fact that the remodeling doesn't always happen in uh, the in the um, axial orientation, so that it doesn't actually change the uh, competency of the mitral valve. Whereas the the remodeling may occur where, as the heart sort of shrinks down, it doesn't really affect that that sort of length of the neocord. So I haven't seen that as a major concern in the patients that I have reoperated on. Uh, I've seen disease progression uh, in uh, in other segments. Um, that uh, that um, that uh, that uh, were previously untreated. I had another patient uh, who had individual neocords reconstructed uh, from another uh, from another site overseas and came back and then had ruptured uh, these these cords, um, which I haven't seen with the neocordy loops. Uh, and so that patient, I went ahead and re-repaired that patient. But I, I, I think your question is a valid question, but I can tell you that in a dozen years now and following these patients, I haven't seen uh, a major concern with the length estimation and remodeling of the ventricle and recurrent MR. Awesome, thanks so much. Pleasure. Sarb? Um, thanks, Dr. Chu. Uh, I was just uh, gonna ask, you know, it, with regards to that negative remodeling, but you also mentioned that the co-optation length that you go for is on the longer side, where with the shorter co-optation lens, you did see more MR. So I wonder if there is negative remodeling, you're already addressing that with a longer co-optation lens to begin with, so that even if there is a little bit of adjustment, your co-optation surface is still there, not to create that MR. And when you do have shorter co-optation with that negative remodeling, you did show that there was more MR in those patients than down the road. Yeah, it's possible. Um, 
we're still digging into it because what we do notice as well in the shorter coaptation height was that those tend to be more resection patients as well, uh, rather than just neocord patients. So it, it's probably a little bit more complicated than that, but it's possible. It's possible. Any other questions or comments? I know that there's several other experienced surgeons on the line and um, I would be more than happy to hear their thoughts or have them share their experiences as well. I'm also happy to uh, share, uh, I didn't really talk much about reoperative uh, mitral repair. Um, I could show you for two minutes uh, an interesting case just to highlight a point. And, and so for those that, um, those that, uh, that may, um, uh, may question the validity of the minimally invasive approach, um, no one will argue in patients such as this. So can you see my screen? Yeah, you're good. Okay. So this is a, a, a recent case, but it highlights the advantage of a uh, of the minimally invasive approach in reoperation. So this is a 41 year old uh, girl from Newfoundland uh, who had a type A dissection repair back in 2005. She had a a uh, mechanical valve conduit and hemi arch reconstruction, and she uh, Corey had sent her out to me uh, because she had. Uh, developed an arch aneurysm. And so I, I brought her here and we did a hybrid arch frozen elephant trunk reconstruction and she did quite well after that. Um, and, uh, but over time uh, we've been watching her and she has, um, she has developed uh, this uh, increasing growth of her descending thoracic aorta and really needs a thoracal abdominal. And so I actually referred on to morale uh, to do an open thoracal abdominal on her. And as morale was working her up, she found that she had uh, bileaflet prolapse with severe MR. And, um, and so uh, this is an interesting sort of case because uh, the question becomes, you know, this is a 41-year-old woman, a young woman who has a very easily repairable valve surgically, um, but very difficult sort of anatomy with multiple reoperations, a bit of a pectus. Uh, she has a enlarging thoracal abdominal aortic aneurysm. Um, and so the question is how, how to, how to redo this, this sort of operation. So morale actually sent her back to me, uh, to <clears throat> consider doing her minimally invasively. So, uh, a couple of, of the principles are that, you know, um, that it's really, uh, great to be able to come through that, uh, minimally invasive approach, but how do you, how do you cannulate and get on pump? Uh, and so, uh, you don't want to, I, I really did not want to retrograde perfuse that, that large thoracal abdominal aorta. So what I did is I, I redid the axillary cannulation, uh, and cut down on my previous graft and then sewed another graft to it, uh, to the hood of it, uh, to make sure that I was always flowing anti-grade. Uh, and then I percutaneously cannulated the, the internal jugular vein and then the, um, and then the, uh, the, uh, femoral vein. And, um, and here you can see uh, the root pushing down so that even though we're coming through a right mini thoracotomy with the root is pushing down uh, the anterior portion. So it makes it hard to see that anterior portion. Um, and you can see the blood coming back, even though it's a mechanical aortic valve, there's enough blood there that's in your face. So I, I, show, I show this, uh, you know, it's a very simple sort of repair in this case. Uh, it's a posterior triangular resection um, and um, and you can get you know, quite nice exposure to it. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's very simple reapproximation. I like to use interrupted uh, Gore-Tex sutures rather than running, but some people like to use running. Um, and uh, when I do my resections, uh, the most important thing is to place your suture at the uh, free margin first uh, to be able to ensure that you have uh, resected enough so that you, uh, so that, um, you're not going to have to readjust it, and that it's that it's reduced nicely down into the ventricle, uh, and then once once you're done that, you can see uh, I've done in this case. Uh, getting back to Ali's question, I've done a um, an annuloplasty uh, ring here, uh, and I decided in this case to use Cornot uh, to try and help, which uh, which I don't use that often, but I think it's a good sort of tool to help in some of these uh, challenging uh, challenging cases. So. 
and then here you can see the, the sort of final sort of saline test result uh, with a valve uh, with a heart defibrillator. And, uh, and so uh, here you can see um, in follow-up, uh, she uh, has done well. She stayed in the hospital for about six days um, and she had a mean peak rate of two and six across the valve. Um, you can see, you know, even though it's less invasive, there's still quite a bit of uh, bruising along the chest wall there initially at the get-go. But, you know, with this, now she's going to, she's recovered now and, and she's going to go back to morale, uh, who's going to do her open thoracal abdominal from the previous frozen elephant trunk all the way down. So this really highlights, uh, you know, the, the advantage of the uh, minimally invasive approach in a patient population that is very challenging. Uh, and this is probably the most common reason why I get sent patients from other surgeons uh, for operation, reoperations, morbidly obese, um, porcelain aortas, uh, these sorts of things. It, it, you know, having this tool there is a really nice option. And I, and I, I know that in many of the cases, uh, in, in, in many centers, you'll just do a mitroclip to it. But I'll tell you, um, you know, MetroClip works, you know, works pretty well for functional, uh, but in, in degenerative uh, mitral regurgitation, um, you know, at our hands, the results are not the best. Um, so, you know, if you can give the patient a surgical repair, particularly in a young patient like this, it's really, uh, you know, remember the, the, the survival benefit that you're giving to them. That's important to remember. So any other questions or comments? Is there anything else from anybody? There was a nice comment about you in the chat, Dr. Chu. <laughs> that it was an excellent presentation and your gifted ability to be clear, logical and practical. You're a gifted, practical, honest clinical surgeon and very good teacher. So there you go. <laughs> Thanks so much, Thanks Dr. Hugh Scully. Oh, yes. that's very kind yeah. of me. <laughs> um, awesome. So yeah, if there are... Oh, wait, Rasha has raised her hand. So you can go ahead and ask your question. Hi, thank you, Dr. Shu. This was a very nice presentation. I'm R5 from McGill. Um, I have a question about how you deal uh, um, about SAM when you find it out in TROP. Do you uh, defer it until you, you, you uh, repeat another echo after post-op or you deal with it at, uh, at the intra-op setting? So I think that's a good question, Rasha. Um, I have to admit, I, I personally believe that with the neocord repair technique, SAM is much less common because you're using bigger rings. Uh, you're pulling the redundant tissue away from uh, the uh, left ventricular outflow tract uh, oftentimes. Uh, but nonetheless, it will happen to everyone, including myself. I think the important thing is to take your time, load the heart, um, reduce the inotropes, beta block the patient down and wait. And the problem is, is that you're always in that situation where you're feeling pressure, you gotta to get to the next case, just wait. Just take your time, get the patient into a normal sort of hemodynamic state, load that ventricle. And, um, and the thing is you can just watch uh, by uh, several things. You can watch by um, how much uh, MR you have left uh, and you can watch by the gradients across the LVOT to see if it's resolving and getting better. And if it is resolving and getting better, then you can feel pretty confident that if you continue to wait longer, that it probably will go away on its own. If you think that you've structurally caused an abnormality to cause the SAM, for example, one of the mistakes that you can make with neocord reconstruction is if you're placing neocordy loops to particularly to the anterolateral papillary muscle, if you're placing it too far anterior where you've chosen the spot in the muscle, or if you've chosen uh, to apply it to segments of the mitral valve that are too far away from that papillary head, you'll actually pull the leaflet, the anterior leaflet into the LVOT and cause SAM. Uh, and that's one exception to the rule, where in that case, you will never make it better. You need to go back and come up with a different repair strategy to try and fix it. And so if you think you've caused something like that, don't leave the operating room, try and address and fix it, including if it requires converting to a sternotomy or, or coming up with another solution. What I can tell you is in most cases, when you wait long enough, it will always go away. And the thing is when you are the resident who's following the patient or the attending or whoever, when you go by, uh, here's a little trick of mine. 
to follow the SAM when you're in the ICU. The easy trick, you know, you'll always want to ask for an echo, an echo, an echo, but you won't be able to have an echo there all the time. The easy trick is to take your stethoscope, put it across the uh, aortic region and the LVOT and listen, listen for the high pitch velocity murmur of the SAM. As the SAM goes away, that will go away. If you still hear it with your stethoscope, you know that you still have the SAM. The MR murmur sometimes is hard to hear because it's posterior laterally oriented and you can't roll the patient around, but the LV VOT murmur is easy to hear and you will always hear that. So take your stethoscope and listen. And, you know, if it doesn't go away, load the heart more, slow the, you know, crank up the esmolol higher, get the heart rate down lower um, and, uh, and try again. It's a little trick, but it works really well. So thanks for the great question, Rasha. Thanks, doctor. So actually I have another question. Do you use uh, another like uh, uh, methods like non-resectional leaflet inversion or like uh, leaflet, uh, uh, new co cordial transfer uh, instead of the new cordial? Um, so when I was with Chitwood, he liked to use lots of cordial transfers. Uh, he would take the robot and transfer cords all over the place. I, I've never been a big fan of that technique. I always worry about the integrity of the cord when you reattach it. I always worry that, um, you know, that cord is elongated and diseased uh, and that, you know, it would be prone to rupture. I know lots of people historically in the past have done it but I worry about the durability of it. So I, I generally do not use it. Um, if, you know, if uh, push came to shove and there was no other options, then, you know, I think you could look at it as, as a possibility, but I, it's, it's never been one of the things I've used as a go-to. Thank you, Dr. Wonder. You're welcome. Awesome. So if there are no other questions, uh, I think we will let Dr. Chu go for the night. Uh, thank you so much again for presenting to us tonight. It was an awesome talk. As always, guys, the talk will be posted on the YouTube channel, which the link is included in the chat box if you haven't seen it already, uh, as well as all the other previous lecture series. So thank you so much again, Dr. Chu, for joining us tonight. My pleasure. Take care, guys. Keep in touch and feel free to come visit London anytime. <laughs>